Hello and welcome to another MIG Labs video. Today's video is going to be on what's called the trauma triad of death. Trauma triad of death. And we deal with a lot of triads in medicine, but the trauma triad of death is perhaps the most ominous sounding, and for good reason. Uh, it's a very serious condition that happens in, as you can guess, trauma patients, and it has very poor outcomes. So patients who fall into this trauma triad of death tend to die, hence the name. But the good news is that as EMS providers, as pre-hospital providers, there's actually a fair amount that we can do to prevent or sometimes even reverse the trauma triad of death before it's too late. So that's what I want to talk about. Before we dive too much into that, I want to remind you if you didn't know already or if you haven't been there already, there's a PDF outline on our website, on the MIG Labs website. And the outline has uh, all the information I talk about plus a little bit more. So it'll help you if you want to learn more, if you want to find out exactly what I'm talking about because maybe I didn't explain it very well. It also has the references that I use to develop this lesson. So if you want to kind of dig into the real deep part and understand, well, how did this study work or what was the data in that study, you can get all those references through the PDF outline. So I highly recommend you have it. You can also follow along. The video follows the outline. So you can pull it up on your screen, print it off, follow along, whatever you want to do. So I'll talk real quickly just about trauma in general. Trauma. Trauma is something that a lot of EMS providers, uh, it makes them a little nervous because compared to a medical patient, there's not a whole lot we can do for trauma patients. Um, we can do some really good BLS, things like controlling bleeding and managing the airway, but especially as ALS providers, there's not much we can do. There's not a lot of ALS that trauma patients benefit from. And that's something that tends to make us uncomfortable, you know, especially us paramedics. We've been to this school. We've learned all these fancy things. We want to use those fancy things. And when we encounter patients who can't benefit from those fancy things, well, we don't know what to do with ourselves. Trauma, as my instructors told me, is a surgical disease. And the point they were trying to make is that it's a disease, quote unquote, that can really only be cured by a surgeon, by surgery. As EMS providers, the best we can do is try and keep that patient alive and healthy to the best of our extent until we can get them to an operating room and let the surgeon cure or fix that trauma disease. That said, there are a lot of things we can do in the field to improve their chances of surviving, to improve their outcomes in the OR. So three factors have been identified as being of particular importance in trauma. And these are three factors that correlate to very poor outcomes in our patients. Patients who develop these three factors tend to die, as we were saying earlier. So the first one is hypothermia. Hypothermia. The second one is acidosis. And the third one is coagulopathy. Coagulopathy. So let's talk about each of these. Hypothermia is, of course, the patient just getting too cold. And I'll go over here how these studies defined each of these things, but don't worry about memorizing this, you know, the cutoffs or the lab values. It's not so much important to us as pre-hospital providers, but I'll go ahead and talk about it just so we understand. Hypothermia, as according to these studies, is a patient's core temperature dropping below 35 degrees Celsius, which is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Acidosis, that's just when the patient's blood becomes too acidic. There's too much acid in the blood. This was defined in those studies by a pH of less than 7.2. And coagulopathy was defined in these studies. And just before I get to the definition, coagulopathy is just the body not being able to clot efficiently. So your blood is not able to clot the way it's supposed to. Uh, it was defined in the studies with a lab value called INR, which is international normalized ratio. Don't worry about that. You don't need to know it. But they define it as an INR of greater than 1.5. So these are the three factors that become the trauma triad of death when they're together. One study showed that half of all trauma patients brought in by EMS, half of EMS trauma patients, were hypothermic when they arrived at the hospital. 
So when we rolled through those doors, when we offloaded from the ambulance and rolled through the hospital doors, half of our trauma patients are hypothermic. And similarly, a third of our trauma patients are coagulopathic. That's pretty good numbers there. I mean, not good, but big numbers. A lot of our patients are suffering from hypothermia and coagulopathy and acidosis as well, although I don't know that a study has been done on how acidotic or how many of our patients are acidotic upon arrival. There's even more bad news. Let me extend down my little table here. Some other studies were done, and one of them showed that if a patient becomes 32 degrees Celsius or colder, 32 degrees Celsius, they had a 100% death rate. Every single patient who got that cold, and uh, 32 degrees Celsius is about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So every single patient whose core temperature dropped below 32 Celsius or 90 Fahrenheit, every single one of them died. With coagulopathy, one study found that every single patient who developed extreme coagulopathy died as well. 100% death rate for them as well. So you can start to see why these factors are so bad for our patients. They have very bad outcomes, and not only do they have bad outcomes, but a lot of our patients roll into the hospital doors already with these conditions. So by the time that the hospital gets to them, they've already developed these things. However, there's even more bad news about the trauma triad of death. So let me explain that. I'm going to go and draw those three factors up here again. Hypothermia, uh, coagulopathy we'll put down here coagulopathy, and acidosis. So the bad news is that each of these three factors can worsen the other factors. So hypothermia specifically can worsen coagulopathy. Coagulopathy can worsen acidosis. And acidosis can worsen hypothermia. Now, I don't want to spend too much time just explaining exactly how that happens because it can kind of drag on and this lesson can easily become way too long. But just understand that these three can feed each other. And when they do that, the patients start spiraling and spiraling, getting worse and worse and worse until they die. And if you think I'm not serious about them dying, I am. Uh, several studies have been done that looked at the mortality rate for patients who had all three of these conditions. One study found it to be 50%, another study found it to be 70%, and another study by the U.S. Army found it to be 90%. So we're looking at a 50 to 90% death rate for all patients who become hypothermic, acidotic, and coagulopathic. 50 to 90%. To put this another way, that's saying that if we let our patients develop these three conditions, then we're giving them, at best, a 50-50 chance of living or dying. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not much of a gambler. I don't like those odds. I wouldn't want to get into an ambulance knowing that I have, at best, a 50% chance of surviving, and at worst, a 10% chance of surviving. So what can we do? How can we stop patients from getting into this trauma triad of death and dying? Well, Let's address solutions to each factor one at a time. So that first one, the hypothermia. The second one was the acidosis. And the third one was the coagulopathy. So making this table just like we had earlier, if I can draw a straight line, and let me preface all three of these things by saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Maybe you heard your mom say that growing up or something. It's a common phrase, but it really holds true, especially in the trauma triad of death. It is much, much easier to prevent one or all of these three factors from um, coming on in our patients than it is to try and reverse them once they've already set in. So hypothermia, how can we prevent that? Well, the biggest thing is exposure. We're trained in EMS to expose our patients, right? I, I was taught that uh, 
a naked trauma patient is a happy trauma patient. You want to cut the clothes off so you can examine, so you can perform a good physical assessment. And that's good. I'm not discouraging that. You need to do that. It's good to uh, give a full assessment of your patient. But think about what you do when you're done exposing the patient. Do you cover them up with a blanket or do you leave them lying naked and exposed to the air? So try and cover them up with a blanket or maybe even with their clothes, you can take their cut-up clothes and lay them over them when they're done or something, something to reduce the amount of cold air that's blowing across their body. And turn up the heat in your ambulance. Uh, I've heard people say that if you're not sweating, it's not hot enough. And for the most part, that's true. You're not going to be comfortable as a provider. You're going to be hot, but it's good for your patient, and we need to do what's best for our patients. Another thing to consider is our IV fluids. So if you're giving your patient IV fluids, chances are those fluids were just kept in the ambulance. They weren't in a warmer, unless you have a warmer, which is great if you do. But room temperature, as you know, is colder than the body's core temperature. So if we give patients IV fluids that are at room temperature, then we're cooling them off. And if your, air, your ambulance is air conditioned, then it's even further below room temperature. So we're going to cool them off even more. We're going to cause this hypothermia. So if you can... Try and warm your fluids. If you have an actual official fluid warmer, that's obviously the best. But if not, you can get creative too. I've seen people take instant hot packs and wrap them around the bags of fluids. So something to warm up your IV fluids. Another thing you can consider is limiting your fluid administration. So, of course, I'm not saying don't give your patients fluid. If you think they need fluid, you need to give them fluid. But don't overload them. Don't give them any more than they need. Make sure you give them just what they need and no more. Let's talk about the acidosis. Now, this is really hard for us to reverse or to fix. Really, the only thing you could give that's commonly found in the EMS drug box would be sodium bicarbonate, which can increase the pH. But that's really risky because it has to be done in a very controlled fashion. If you give too much sodium bicarb, your patient will become alkalotic. And it's not good to be acidotic. It's also not good to be alkalotic. So I wouldn't recommend giving sodium bicarbonate unless you're one of those progressive agencies that has some sort of blood chemistry analyzer on your, uh, on your ambulance, an ISTAT or something similar, where you can actually find out, find out exactly what the pH is. And then working with your medical director, you can have a protocol. If the patient's blood pH is X, then you give Y amount of sodium bicarbonate. If you don't have that, I would not recommend trying to use sodium bicarbonate. What you can do, again, is prevent acidosis. And one of the best ways to do this is with selecting the proper IV fluid. So something I learned when I was preparing for this lesson is that normal saline is actually fairly acidic. You don't really think of it that way. I, I knew that it was a little acidic, but I thought it was negligible. Turns out it's actually fairly acidic. It, it's, it can really bring down the patient's pH. Some studies have concluded that lactated ringer solution is suitable for resuscitation. So giving LR, lactated ringers, can be just as good as giving normal saline to a trauma patient. And they went on to say that the use of normal saline in massive fluid resuscitation should be discouraged. So maybe consider giving lactated ringers instead of normal saline. And again, of course, work with your medical director. I'm not trying to change your protocols, and I wouldn't recommend you do anything based on my guidelines alone. I'm just telling you what the, what the literature is showing, what the evidence and the studies are showing. This gives you something to open up a conversation with your medical director to sit down and talk about some protocols if you don't already have these in your protocols. And finally, coagulopathy. This is another one that's really tough to fix once it sets in. The best things you can do to reverse it once it's already happened would be blood products, administering blood products, or giving TXA. So some agencies do carry blood, and they do carry TXA, that's tranexamic acid. If you have those two and it's in your protocols, those are usually the most effective ways to reverse coagulopathy. But if you don't have those in your protocols, if you don't have access to those two things, then what do you do? Well, once again, just like with hypothermia and with acidosis, the best thing to do is to prevent it. So number one, I'm going to change colors to red here because this is the most important of all the guidelines here, is stop the bleeding. Bleeding is what caused the coagulopathy in the first place. That's what got us into the trauma triad of death. Your trauma patient was bleeding. The clotting factors that were in that blood have now exited the body, 
And that started the coagulopathy, which then started the other two, and that's what got us in this spiral. So stop the bleeding. If you don't stop the bleeding, none of the other interventions will matter. None of them matter at all if you can't stop the bleeding. Another thing that you can do is to limit your fluid intake. I'm sorry, your fluid administration. Limit fluid administration. And this is basically because as you're giving fluid, you're giving crystalloid fluid specifically, like normal saline or lactated ringers, you're diluting whatever clotting factors are left in the blood. So you already have a, a low concentration of clotting factors because a patient has bled a lot of those clotting factors out. But now if you pump them full of IV fluid, you're diluting it even more. So again, if they need fluid, give them fluid, but don't give them any more than they need. The American College of Surgeons which is the group that creates ATLS, the Advanced Trauma Life Support Guidelines, and many of us have taken the ATLS classes or many others have heard of it. It's becoming a standard for trauma care, especially pre-hospital. They used to recommend the initial fluid administration for trauma patients at two liters. They used to recommend two liters of fluid. They've now recently brought that down to one liter, so they've cut the recommendation in half. So you can see even the American College of Surgeons, even the people who created and update ATLS are starting to realize that maybe we're giving our patients too much fluid. And finally, the last thing here, this is sort of a novel approach here. We have something called an ITD, an impedance threshold device. Maybe you've heard of it. There's a common one on the market called the Rescue Pod. There are other ones as well, but this is sort of the most common one that we're seeing more and more of. And these are devices that attach to your airway. So let's imagine here's the airway. The patient would be down here. And here's our little connector up here. An impedance threshold device goes over the connector. And then you plug your bag valve mask or your ventilator or whatever you're using onto that impedance threshold device. And that goes to wherever it's going, bag valve mask, ventilator, whatever. So the impedance threshold device is that guy right there. It goes in between your airway and wherever your air source is going to be. And all it does is it maintains a little bit of negative pressure in the chest. It's usually used on um, patients who are receiving CPR. So as you're doing compressions and as you're breathing for the patient, this reduces the amount of pressure in the chest. Now, of course, you can't use this on a conscious patient, but you also probably wouldn't have an advanced airway on a conscious patient. There was a study where they had pigs and they bled more than 50% of the blood out of these pigs. So these pigs are at less than half of their normal blood volume. And so they're in hypovolemic shock. And in some of these pigs, they gave them advanced airways, and they attached an impedance threshold device, an ITD. But they didn't give them any fluids, no fluids at all, just the impedance threshold device. And that caused an increase in 10 to 15 points in the systolic blood pressure. That's 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury increase in blood pressure from doing nothing other than putting this ITD on the airway. It creates that negative pressure in the chest that helps to draw blood back into the core, back into the heart and the lungs. And so if you have a patient who's really bad and, and they're really circling the drain and maybe they're unconscious and now you've intubated them or given them some other sort of airway, they're basically they've already been in that trauma try to death for a little while and they're spiraling and they're close to death, you might consider, with consultation with your medical director, using an impedance threshold device as sort of a last resort to increase their blood pressure without having to give them fluid, without having to dilute those clotting factors, without having to make them more acidotic, without making them more hypothermic. Something to consider, and like I said, something to talk with your medical director about. So that's it. That's the trauma triad of death, just the basics. The most important thing to remember is that you need to prevent these three factors, hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy. If you can prevent those three from setting in, or even if you can prevent one or two, you will give your patient a significantly better chance of survival.